good afternoon uh, it's my pleasure to have arvind pani on our instagram live session and you know i was just thinking it's you know in the middle of the week which is on a wednesday afternoon and on the 15th of september which also makes it you know the middle of the month right so what a coincidence and before i you know get started with arvind uh, i think you know i should introduce arvind to all of you arvind is the co-founder of reverie language technologies and in early 2019 geo acquired reverie to help them fulfill their 3 to 3 mission to touch the lives of 500 million users entrepreneurship was his childhood dream which started with his brother vivek and eventually both of them ended up as he calls it partners in crime at reverie he is a firm believer in entrepreneurship the hard way and in fact he chose one of the toughest problems plaguing the indian internet which is the problem of language discrimination in fact arvin dreams of the day when indian internet will be inclusive with equal opportunity for all indians revery is arvin's uh, second attempt at entrepreneurship with the first one teaching him more about what not to do as an entrepreneur and prior to his uh, entrepreneurial ventures arvin worked with intel for over 7 years before realizing that he was a misfit in a corporate environment and i just also realized you know that uh, outside of his passion for revery arvin also has you know a range of very impressive uh, interests he likes driving playing piano and listening to analog music through vinyl records so that's you know really interesting so wish you a very warm welcome to the show arvind thank you so much tipu and uh, really appreciate the very very warm welcome and absolutely a pleasure to be in in the show with you yeah thank you arvind so arvind i am going to talk about you know uh, a range of topics and uh, i'm sure you know you will enjoy this conversation because arvind is very erudite and very articulate and let me start you know with just you know a couple of context points you know before i get going with arvin one is you know people uh, may be aware or may not even be aware but you know voice search queries in india you know have been growing at a colossal rate of 270% you know year on year and uh, globally over 500 million people uh, use google assistant every month with hindi second only to english as a most commonly used language So Arvind, you know, with just uh, you know this very brief background, you know, uh, let me you know start with you. So my first question is, uh, you know, how do you see the power of voice, you know, developing in India, and do you think it will help in bridging the gap between India and Bharat? So um, Dipu, uh, I will actually give uh, two things as context here. Uh, the about uh, the power of voice in India. and uh, the gap between india and bharat one is uh, the uniqueness of bharat in terms of number of languages and all of us know the number of languages india has uh, if we talk about the dialects then every 40 kilometers the dialects also changes so uh, and even if you take if you try to limit the number of languages and you go by what the indian constitution recognizes the languages with official status there are still 22 languages and even then if you have to filter down there are still about 10 to 11 languages you need to address so that you can say that okay i have a fair amount of coverage for uh, india the second thing is uh, where voice plays a major role now when you are addressing language without voice let's say we are relying Uh, predominantly on text the barrier that we are bridging is essentially the language barrier that anybody who can read or write text in their languages they will be able to do that right beyond just english but what language does also is bridging the what i call as the literacy barrier there are so many indians who can speak their language who can understand but they are not very fluent in reading and writing their language so voice really complements that it fills that void of literacy barrier and then along with text it plays a very important role in bridging the overall language divide yeah absolutely agree with you arvind you know and i was just uh, you know thinking you know a very simple use case for you know voice right in terms of bridging the gap between india and bharat or even you know between two people who speak different languages right let's take a very simple one let's take you know whatsapp right you don't have to necessarily type text what you can do is you know record you know a conversation in your voice and then just send it right it just you know becomes you know a very easy way of you know talking so i think you know with the uh, rise of voice uh, you know what we have seen isn't it becomes a leveler right i mean the whole idea of you know the digital divide 
starts to disappear Absolutely. you know when you can start leveraging voice not only for people to speak but even for translating so two people you know who cannot understand their languages otherwise can have a perfectly you know intelligible conversation that's right yes yeah i'll now get to my uh, you know next question arvind uh, see we all have been hearing a lot about you know ai and uh, ml people use the terms interchangeably people have been you know using these terms you know in a very very big manner it's almost become common speak right but from the perspective of voice right how do you see them you know playing an essential role and also how do you see this development going forward you know in the years to come so uh, ai and ml uh, are playing a role not just in india but uh, worldwide and uh, let's try to understand fundamentally what ai and ml are uh, doing so mostly ai and ml uh, are used in technologies uh, or products rather to mostly to automate okay and uh, therefore the trend in india is also likely to continue now once again here i would like to touch upon the fact that although a lot of ai and ml related uh, research and technological advancements have happened in uh, english language but not much has happened for indian languages right so uh, you don't see many companies who have invested in doing direct ai and ml kind of activities in indian languages so even today when we are working on say natural language understanding which is an integral part of uh, your uh, speech technologies now mostly we see that the 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 nlu which is there for indian languages those are converted into roman script which is english script and nlu models of english are run on that which is a very inefficient model because indian languages are very phonetic in nature which is contrary to roman languages like i will give you a very simple example of my surname as uh, is p a n i and uh, in indian language in my language i am from odisha it would be pronounced as pani but there is no way you could represent pani as rana in english so you would write that is p a n i so when we do an nlu on my name and we convert it to roman script obviously the conversion will uh, conversion will be p a n i and then when we try to retrieve it back for indian language then it is going to be retrieved back as pani and not as pani so <laughs> this is a very simple example of why we believe that the nlu or anything that has to do with ai and ml must be done directly in indian languages so that the properties of the indian languages can be exploited these properties are very unique and different from english and roman based uh, scripts and uh, the other challenge which is there is that uh, because there hasn't been much data that has been created in indian languages you don't have enough data to really train your models train your engines right in indian languages now while that is a challenge i also see that that also becomes a massive opportunity for companies that are focusing on uh, indian languages like us so one of our big focuses is that how do we develop algorithms that can be very efficient so for example a speech engine for understanding uh, extracting speech to text or uh, text to speech or even machine translation for accuracy uh, how can they be algorithmically lot more efficient without having to rely on humongous amount of uh, data so it's a challenge as well as it's an opportunity but the 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 real focus should really be on uh, having this ai and ml ml directly on indian languages instead of trying to uh, uh, apply the english the models which have been designed for english and roman based scripts yeah i mean that you know two points from my side i think one is you have to your point around uh, you know amplifying the reach of ai driven assets uh, you know for uh, people who speak in indian languages so when we launched our chatbot you know we launched it in english and then, you know, we subsequently also began offering you know uh, indian languages so our ai driven bot today you know helps customers you know even with uh, you know some indian languages you know to interact with it so i guess you know that's one way of amplifying uh, you know our reach the other is you know i remember reading this article you know sometime back you know which basically said that if you were to look at you know languages you know which are most computer friendly then sanskrit you know figures right on top so if you know sanskrit gets picked up you know then i guess you know you could start to see tomorrow you know ai ml and a host of technologies you know written in sanskrit and that could be uh, you know in tune with what you said you know that it's better to use this language directly 
and you know use it from first principles you know then go around in a roundabout way that is right and in fact yeah. Yeah, sorry to and the boys is mentioning that uh, in fact earlier to your question about and i mentioned about the number of languages which are there that being a challenge and uniqueness about india and you right. are absolutely spot on that the link language which which used to be sanskrit unfortunately there is not much focus on uh, that but if there is any way we can we can we can get it's it seems like a dream right now or other than a reality today that having a link language of sanskrit can be used as the as the fundamental for right. our computing and communication it seems like a dream but if that is possible then that would be absolutely phenomenal absolutely <laughs> arvin yeah i was saying you know my next question right we all live in covid 19 times right and even though it may look cliche right we can't avoid you know any discussion on the pandemic so now it's of course you know, not the pandemic you know because we are into wave 3 right we're talking about you know the post pandemic times you know so to speak you know compared to what uh, you know happened in march last year so we're hearing a range of uh, you know terms being uh, thrown about uh, contactless experiences voice searches consumption of you know regional languages conversational commerce right these are various terms you know that we see in vogue you know which are riding the wave but if you look at them i think what's integral to the entire value chain is making voice you know the center of everything that we do so do you see uh, do you think that you know this trend is likely to continue so to be able to address that let's uh, focus on uh, what has the pandemic done right and uh, how have things changed post pandemic so honestly if you ask me then uh, i would say there are two major changes that have uh, happened post pandemic one is that there is a massive focus on digital as the primary medium not just for uh, acquisition of customers but also continuing to engage with the customers and i do see that there are many businesses including the banks that were relying heavily on branch banking are now really talking about using digital only and not even having a branch presence in say smaller cities and villages and using digital only as the primary medium to acquire and uh, and engage with uh, the customers so that's one big change that has happened the second big change is that now uh, uh when we are when we are looking at businesses trying to uh, use digital as the primary medium there is a focus on how do we replicate the in person or phys- physical branch or store experience in digital so then now let's draw a comparison assume that a user used is used to Uh, a branch experience or in store experience right so outside the store we don't write for consumers that unless you are digitally savvy you are not welcome inside the store unless you can speak english you are not welcome inside the store so none of those things are done to be able to to welcome a customer a customer is a customer does not matter whether he or she is digitally savvy or not he or she is Uh, is uh, prefers english or not so it is assumed that any customer can walk in have an excellent uh, experience inside the store can interact with uh, any customer service representative and get the job done right now that is the experience that needs to be replicated in digital so all the things that today that we are talking about whether it is voice search or regional language or uh, any kind of interface those are all focused towards delivering that rich digital experience which which is in a, which is in a way an attempt to really replicate the in person experience in the uh, digital environment so uh, <clears throat> therefore i do see that this trend will continue and the technology will continue to be a big driver to deliver that rich experience and it is absolutely mandatory to uh, to really uh, think how all of these things are getting connected to deliver that experience instead of thinking that these are isolated technologies that uh, need to be uh, adopted and this trend is likely to continue not just for acquiring users but also engaging with them and retaining them in the long term yeah absolutely uh, arvin and just to add to what you uh, said i think one of the reasons you know why we feel you know voice is likely to find its place in the sun is because uh, like you pointed out you know how covid net has changed our behavior so one is we all have become very of touch right nobody wants to press you know the button in the elevator nobody wants to press the key in the atm 
So therefore, you know, you see a lot of you know touchless UI UX coming in, and that's where you know voice plays a role because you can just voice your command, you know, and then orders get executed. So for example, our bot is integrated with Alexa and Google Assistant. You know, if you have these devices at home, you know, you just voice your command, right, and then your order gets executed. And secondly, right. I think you point around, you know, branches uh, again. You know, there again we focus focus on a touchless experience. So when customers walk in, because there are no handshakes and you don't exchange uh, paper, we have basically deployed, you know, QR code. So scan the QR code and get, you know, your request fulfilled. And eventually, it leads to not just, you know, uh, acknowledgement of the fact that, you know, we all need to be conscious, cautious of conscious of hygiene and safety, you know. But we can also ensure that if this can be carried out the branch. And the customer, you know, can even do it, you know, sitting at home. So therefore, you not only fix it transactionally, but you also fix it, you know, structurally. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one exciting stat, Arvind, you know, which you know we picked up recently, right, is that uh, you know, in comparison, you know, with fifty-five percent of teens, you know, using voice search, you know, we've seen that you know fifty-six percent of adults also said that they feel, you know, tech savvy when using voice search, you know, mobile and speaker functions. So, what's your take on this? So, there is. I will pick on an interesting word that you use here: tech right. savvy, right. right? Right. And uh, we must, and and that's the crux of this. Uh, the, the the question that you just asked, because see, most of the mobile first users, the people who are using the mobile phone for the first time, they are also using the internet for the first time, which means they have not experienced the internet pre-mobile. Uh, unlike many of the users uh, who have migrated from, say, internet usage on the PC to mobile phone, uh, most of the users today, first time internet users and mobile users are experiencing the internet on the mobile itself. And when we look at that, for this first time users, now <clears throat> the technology is actually a very big barrier. Technology is that how do I use the mobile phone? And and for a moment, I'm not even touching upon language because of course. Language becomes a barrier because everything is in English. But technology, how do I understand the full capability of a smartphone? How do I understand the full potential? How do I use it for various uh, things? And then how do I discover what is my uh, behavior, my usage behavior on this touch device? Then the other animal which is there is the internet. For many of these users, if you ask them that what, what does internet mean to you, you are likely to get very different answers. And none of that is very consistent. So some somebody may say that Facebook is uh, is internet, or somebody may say WhatsApp is internet, right? Somebody may say YouTube is internet. Depending on where they spend spend more time, what is it that they use most? They would like to define internet like that. So we have to understand that these users are kind of new users. They are still figuring out what this entire touch device, smartphone is all about. What this internet is. And it is very similar to when we were experiencing the internet for the first time. It took us some time to really understand the capabilities of that and understand our behavior pattern. So which I call as the adoption cycle, adoption curve, right? Now, <clears throat> given that this technology itself is a barrier and internet, understanding internet, uh, the full potential of internet, both of these are barrier. There would also be an adoption curve for these users to get to a certain level of maturity. Now, what voice has done is voice aids the usability and helps and, and hence helps shorten this maturity cycle, right? So therefore, I do see that voice does play a very, very important role in reducing the technology barrier itself and making people realize that what all they can do with their device as well as with the internet. Right, I mean, in fact, I think you, you know, if you ask people today, you know, which is the most important part of your body, right? I don't think people are going to say, you know, their heart or liver, right? They're basically going to say, you know, their mobile phone. I think it's almost <laughs> become, you know, your alter ego, right? It's an extension of your body. And I think what, uh, you know, the mobile phone has done, because India is a mobile country, and like you rightly said, you know, people experience, you know, the internet through the uh, mobile phone. You know, it's made it, uh, you know, ubiquitous. You know, today a lot of people, you know, use, uh, you know, the mobile internet. And, you know, like you said, you know, YouTube, Facebook, WhatsApp. So I think, you know, this rich multimedia content, right? Some people use it for video, right? For example, a lot of people use WhatsApp for video calls, right? And similarly, you know, voice as well, right? We just spoke about how, you know, people can record messages in their language and send it across. 
i think you know that's what has you know uh, democratized you know decentralized you know the adoption of technology and therefore right. yes boys will you know continue to play a big role i think as long as you yeah. remain in the realm of text you needed to know language but the moment it goes into voice and video you know then the linguistic barriers disappear that's right it's an interesting analogy that you brought up uh, deepu that if you ask anybody that what's the most important part of the body they say mobile phone i right. just go step further saying that uh, that the internet or the data is the pulse right <laughs> so if data is not there <laughs> then right. the most yeah. important part like the heart does not yes. have the pulse in that <laughs> <laughs> yeah very well said i think yeah i think today if you ask people what gives you sleepless nights you know they might say you know that it might be you know by you know wifi being off right <laughs> <laughs> yeah so now like you know let's just play you know the devil's advocate role right we've been discussing you know the uh, you know the spread of voice you know across you know various formats right how true is the assumption you know that india is going to be a voice first digital economy okay so um, i will answer this uh, uh, giving you a little uh, bit of a different perspective now uh, uh, i have heard a lot of people using this these two terms interchangeably voice first and voice only okay. i've also heard users saying uh, people saying that india is going to be a voice only country now while to a large extent i agree that uh, voice will play a major role in india and it could possibly become a voice first country but i don't think india is ever going to become a voice only country right and even for voice first so let me let me give some context of how voice can be used and how it complements other things now uh, earlier i mentioned about the initial behavior or the adoption curve of a new user now usually what happens is that the behavior of a user uh, initially is different from once a user becomes a mature user right so which means there is lot more assistance lot lot more aid that is required uh, before someone becomes a mature user so let me let me just give you a very interesting example that we were trying to do uh, 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 this localization for uh, an e-commerce e-commerce uh, application and website and in e-commerce you would see that there is a category called kids right so kids now for us it is intuitive kids means we know that it's a category for kids where you can find stuff for kids right now if you extrapolate that and you think that anybody who is using the internet in their languages are also mature users and they also intuitively know what it means that's a wrong assumption so kids if you translate directly which we did to bacche right then we actually had users coming back and asking internet pe bacche bhi milte hain kya so the point i'm trying to make is that when you are introducing yeah. someone to something new was as a technology or internet then there is a different way to explain so then you you change that to bachchon ke liye okay that means people understand that this section is for kids now once they have been introduced there they start using it now after that whether you write bachchon ke liye or bacche it does not matter they they intuitively know that so like in english you don't write for kids you write kids right so that's the analogy that i'm talking about and uh, uh, so what what i'm trying to say is that there is a difference in user behavior in the initial stages and when the user becomes a mature user now <clears throat> i have always believed and then voice when we are talking about voice only or even voice first so today when lot of people may be getting introduced to technology and internet through voice it is unlikely that they are going to stick only to voice right so tomorrow privacy may be a concern right now if i am at a public place and we spoke about uh, sending whatsapp voice messages i may do that when i am at home within my family but let's say if i am traveling in public transport i'm at a railway station i'm inside the bus i may not be very comfortable sending out a voice message i may still type at that time and another example i would like to give you is that uh, let's say uh, through voice somebody is trying to shop through e-commerce and uh, the user initiates a voice search 
uh, let's assume that the, the 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 user is trying to purchase a pair of shoes and uh, maybe for benefit of the larger audience i will use hindi here and the user says mujhe juta kharidna hai okay very simple straightforward query mujhe juta kharidna hai now there could be 15 brands of shoes let us assume that it is only a voice voice only conversation then the machine would say read out all the 15 brands right then i have to remember all the 15 brands and then come back okay mujhe bata ka juta chahiye so then within bata ka juta there might be 150 options so i don't expect the machine to read out all the 150 options the color the features and then for me to remember and go back so <clears throat> the best experience would be that i initiate a voice query but then the response includes a combination of images some description about that and maybe user reviews based on which i am likely to make a decision so and uh, i would assume that even in 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 uh, uh, in technologically advanced countries like europe and us where voice has uh, taken off much before in india it has voice has not been able to replace text it is there replace text or images and voice combined with other technologies delivers a rich experience so i would say that all of these things play a complementary role to what i mentioned earlier that in store in branch experience to be replicated in digital how various pieces of the puzzle various technologies come together to deliver that I think uh, Arvind, you know, a very comprehensive answer, and I do like your point on voice first versus voice only, because you are right. You know, uh, in India, you know, we, for example, may not have too many places, you know, where talking is prohibited, right? But in many parts of Europe, right, if you are on a train, for example, right, you can't talk because you know, privacy is important. So in such situations, yes, you know, voice cannot work. It cannot just work, you know, because you can't use voice, right? and then you have to use text. So I think you know the interplay of you know voice and text, you know, will uh, continue. the other is yeah yeah you're right you know around the fact that you know when you translate right like you said you know that when kids become bachche right and people do not think of it you know as kid section right but they think you know that uh, you know our kids available right i remember an interesting example you know from my earlier firm right so the logo was imagination at work and then this marketing guy you know came up with uh, you know a good uh, translation in hindi he said imagination at work is kalpana kaam pe and then you know you had people calling up and wanting to speak to kalpana right so that's how you know people you know interpret so i think because of the fact that you know when you move from one platform to another right voice to text to video right you it's not about just translating it's also about transliteration in the sense how do you change the rules of the game you know when you go to a new platform so therefore yes you know i think they will all coexist you know and there will be a you know there'll be a good intermingling of these three and customers you know finally will figure out you know which platform they want to use right so i guess Absolutely. that's how you know we see the future going along yeah we spoken for a while and i think we covered a range of topics and you know i'll now come to the last question you know which is uh, do these digital interfaces you know and we just touched upon them right do they exist in silos you know for a language first citizens and if yes you know then how can we you know weave them together so my uh, simple answer is that uh, whether they exist in silos for language first citizens the answer is yes that is because uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately i would rather say it is unfortunate because not more than 10% indians uh, understand english and if you look at fluency of english where people can say that i don't need any other language other than english ever then that's not more than 4% in india so when today we are talking about inclusive digital or internet being inclusive then we are talking about 90 to 96% of these people okay who don't necessarily rely only on english so indian languages also play a role if not for for professional uh, requirements for personal requirements for even for people like us we may want to have uh, certain aspects of the internet available to us in indian languages so what has happened is that the internet in india got designed ground up for english users right which is very different from what happened uh, and it's so the advent of internet in india and uh, china were almost about the same time but china took an approach of building the internet ground up 
in their local language and not necessarily adapting it from english and therefore you can see that the contribution of internet to the economy in china is much much bigger than what we are experiencing in india so uh, for for large part of india's population their contribution to uh, internet economy has not been tapped fully and uh, the in, because the internet got designed ground up in english language and now that when we are talking about uh, inclusion we are just trying to adapt what has been designed for english users for indian languages indian language users and that not that is not necessarily the best solution and uh, uh, also most of the decision makers decision makers like us business decision makers influencers we know english very well so it's very difficult for us to really get into the shoes of an indian language user who does not understand english at all and see what challenges they might be going through in terms of design experience and how those can be catered to so uh, <clears throat> uh therefore what people like us tend to perceive as most of these experience challenges as technology challenges that i would like to introduce translation somewhere okay some language interface somewhere voice somewhere but we are not looking at this as a totality of an experience that could be delivered so that is a fundamental challenge now what could change now in terms of change i would suggest that uh the the thinking thinking of designing for india first that means let's for a moment assume that english as a language does not exist in india then what is it that we would do to reach out to the users how can we engage with them now that design that design thinking that mindset would be very different from designing something for english and adapting it for indian languages so that's number one second one is uh and this is something i am a very big proponent of that know your customer businesses are anyway investing in knowing their customers even government has there are more than 1 billion aadhar card users so if there is intent by the government and also businesses one simple step we could include is know your customers language in which language your customer prefers to communicate now in today's age when uh, mobility is like people can move from anywhere to anywhere it is really impractical or unfair to assume that just because someone is in maharashtra would prefer to communicate in marathi language and i am from odisha but i have been in bangalore for uh, 22 years i would love to see something a business really know that i prefer odia language and uh, co- communicate with me in odia even in say karnataka so uh, now so understanding the the language so kyc is part of kyc know your customer understanding their language preference and once that is done also trying to deliver that experience omni channel that means if i am trying to acquire a customer if i am running a campaign then that campaign could be in that language once i have acquired a customer whether it is my website or my application or it is an ivr wherever the customer is trying to engage with the business that could be in that language without having to start in english and then trying to find out how he or she can get to uh, his or her own language so and then finally i would like to say that if businesses are really thinking of tapping the indian language audience then in our mind uh, <clears throat> imagining a seamless experience uh, how seamless the experience is for english language user and aspire to deliver the same level of experience for indian languages because if you take a user and then you take for a moment let's be language agnostic and we just identify users the user needs are the same they are not different the user need of an english language user is no different from uh, a need of an indian language user so if in our mind if we can really say that how can we continue to improve our experience for indian language user so that the quality or richness of the experience in digital is at par with what english language users are experiencing we will actually go a long way in delivering a truly inclusive experience and removing the barriers which are there for uh, both language as well as uh, technology and that has been one of our endeavors since we started this 
and even though we are working on language technologies our aspiration is that how can we address every aspect of users digital journey in their languages and we of course work with businesses like you who have users who have multiple channels and want to engage with the users across all the channels in their languages yeah. absolutely arvin and you know two three points struck me you know as you spoke i think you know know your customers language is an interesting concept i think what firms need to do and this is actually because a long time back you know one customer told me this and uh, it was in a context that uh, you know what he would like to see firms do is not just draw them in at the point of entry you know in the language of their choice but carry it through you know to the very end so you know the moment yeah. firms ask for that information they need to be ready right the point of sourcing service to the entire life cycle you know so i think that's one the second is to your point around uh, you know knowing customers because it's not a technology or a digital challenge it's an experience or a totality challenge right there was a very interesting harvard business review article you know which said that if let's say you are a highly educated person you know you cannot expect the customer to be like you because you will get customers across you know the entire spectrum so therefore what's important is you know a variant of crowdsourcing which is involve customers from across the spectrum you know in this entire journey because when they give you feedback you know then it becomes uh, you know real the third is you know in terms of india and china and you know various play play you know various uh, you know societies and various countries my view is moment you say internet you're talking about www which is the world wide web so i think it's all about ensuring that uh, you know you are inclusive within your country and outside your country so you obviously leverage global languages so that people get access to a global mindset at the same time like you rightly said you know we need to get people from within the uh, ecosystem you know within your own country you know to be part of the entire sphere and i think if that can happen and you know if it becomes you know one big global community you know then the internet would have truly lived up to its potential absolutely yes yeah but uh, thank you arvind i think you know it's been a really good conversation uh, i think you know a lot of uh, pearls of wisdom for the audience so uh, you know hopefully they've enjoyed this so thanks to you and thanks to the audience and thanks to all the people you know who work behind the scenes to make it happen in a seamless fashion thanks to everyone thank you so much deepu it was a wonderful conversation i absolutely enjoyed uh, being part of this show and having a very engaging discussion with you thank you thank you arvind